Hey, thanks for joining us today. This is Anthony Parent of IRS Medic. And today we're going to answer the question, is U.S. citizenship a good idea if you don't plan on moving to the U.S.? Now, we're not going to be talking about whether or not it's a good idea to get U.S. citizenship in the abstract, but, 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 but rather, well, actually, this is kind of answering that question. Is it, is it a good idea in the abstract, right? Um, so with me today, uh, John Richardson, who wrote an article that was uh, going to form the basis of this. Uh, he wrote that on Citizenship Solutions, and you'll find the link to that down below in the description. You follow that. Along with Keith Redman, who posted this curious little innocent question on his American expatriates group. Now over 9,000 uh, followers on that. And I know we have a lot of people from there joining us today. Thank you so much for joining us today. So let's get into it. Good morning, gentlemen. How are you doing? Hey, okay. good morning. All right. So I got to uh, have a little bit of a slideshow. Uh, uh, and this is sort of uh, help with the help of John. I created this. Um, the question we want to answer is casual American citizenship worth it? OK, this again, this is not whether or not your U.S. citizenship is worth it if you plan on living and moving to the U.S. And by the way, if you do and if you're kind of wondering if, if your U.S. citizenship is worth it, it, it that actually, I've been a little negative on the U.S. lately um, because of the tax code. So I interviewed a, a, um, I interviewed an American success story, uh, Miles Wakeham, and I put the link to that below where he says there actually is something very unique about America. And I didn't really see it. Um, it took someone from the outside to show me what is special about America. There is special things about America. Um, but this is about whether or not just getting a citizenship is a good idea for you know your vanity because you think it's cool. Or, hey, look, I just want to have the option. Hey, maybe my kids want to go to college in the U.S. or whatever it is, um, just keeping that, that option open, right? Um, and so we always say, because we, we, we deal with this every day, is the awful taxation about it. So we're always, I guess, those nerds kind of dragging down the party, <laughs> saying, whoa, 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 put on the brakes before you get that U.S. citizenship. Uh, we want to tell you a few things. Now, we put it up there. Now, Keith, Keith, thank yes. thank you so much for joining me this morning. Keith, yeah. you put a question. you put a question up. And so what, were you surprised? What was your question that you put up, and were well, you surprised wrote, by the reaction? Yeah, the, the question was, and I'll, I'll state exactly what I wrote, um, was it's mind-boggling to me that someone would obtain U.S. citizenship knowing they won't live in the U.S. or live in the U.S. forever. Why would one do it to oneself as it inhibits one the freedom to live a normal life outside the U.S.? What am I missing? Mm. that's my question meaning that you know yeah. you know why would you obtain i'm not talking about people that have it i'm talking about why would you obtain u.s citizenship knowing that you're not going to live in the u.s forever or go there to live in the u.s right. forever you know because it, it, there is a hindrance in having it so and then i ask what am i missing well and i don't think it's you that's missing it well no well, i, I don't to know yeah i wanted to know from the audience at large in that group if i'm missing something and I had a range of comments. I've had I w had very nasty comments that personally attacked me, <laughs> and they're no longer members of the group. Oh, that's wow. not the intent. Oh my God. But uh, but I also had some very insightful comments that I learned something from. So it actually right. was a good post. All right. Yeah. No. It was great. It made me. And you know, it really made me think. And it made well made uh, our, our our great guest John Richardson think a little bit. He put on his thinking cap. Um, and uh, John, uh, I think I think you you basically I think you nailed it in your article why we had so many varying dis differing opinions um, about about what can happen because you know really for for a lot of people and this is the thing that we fight is that it the U.S. income tax overseas isn't that big of a deal. People are blowing it out of proportion, and we're creating a whole tax channel of talking about it all the time because we have nothing else to do, I guess. Um, but John actually did write an article, and this is something before we get to that, I, I want to go over the, the reasons why we have these varying different opinions and, and how the income tax um, goes over. But I want to, I want to, uh, I want to, uh, time for a pop quiz. This is a pop quiz, okay? And this is uh, sort of why we kind of, you know, why, why we could throw a lot of, uh, um, um, we could really harsh your mellow on your U.S. passport, because here's a question for you. Here's a pop quiz. Suppose you are a wealthy individual. You have citizenship in Monaco. You decide it would be a hoot to get U.S. citizenship so you can impress your friends with a cool looking U.S. passport. After you get your U.S. citizenship, you decide to 
decide to sell your villa in Monaco for $40 million. You bought this villa in, for $1 million in 1982. What is your approximate U.S. tax due? Number one, zero. The U.S. income tax does not apply to property you own overseas. Number two, zero. The U.S. income tax gives you a stepped-up basis in property, so the fair market value of the date of your naturalization. Therefore, you're gaining, there is no capital gain. Three, tax treaties forbid double taxation. Four, about $9,222,500. John Richardson, what's your answer on this one? Well, the answer is clearly four. There you go. I even knew that one. <laughs> yeah. There you go. That's right. That's actually right. So this is why we yeah, really so want people out of that, yeah. You know how they get out of it, and you know, it's an interesting point is that um, they would uh, renounce U.S. citizenship. Um, I think I'd have to check this, but I think there's a provision in the exit tax rules uh, that may limit the taxable gain to the difference between uh, the Fair market value. <laughs> yes, you're right. <laughs> so, so they, so they obtain the U.S. citizenship, well, and then when they when they want to go sell, they renounce their U.S. citizenship. Well, that's for the exit tax. Is that that's actually not for the income tax? It's for the exit tax. Yeah. Of, the, of the basis, right? Meaning, yeah. you know, how much is the gain going to be? Yeah, and now, so, so an American citizen, for somebody who's been an American citizen their whole life. Uh, number four would accurately describe it. Yeah. Let's say that this person uh, became an American citizen in, say, you know, 2010. Um, I don't want to commit to this solely. I never know what, what we're going to be into on these podcasts, but I think yeah. I'm right that in that case, in that particular case, the basis would be the difference between the fair market value and the fair market value on the date of becoming a U.S. person, which this would was, yeah. be the day you became a green card holder, right? Because remember, right. you have to go from, you know. This was actually, a, this was, I changed the facts slightly. This was a real case of mine. Uh, I, I got a call from a gentleman. Um, he It was slightly different. Numbers were slightly different. Um, but he was in a horrible situation because he did not get any uh, tax help beco before becoming a U.S. person. And so he didn't report his, he didn't report all of his worldwide income. He entered into the voluntary disclosure program Oh, boy. They they calculated his gains based on on the value of of the date of acquisition, not a date of naturalization. I looked it up and I I could I was surprised. I did my research. I was like, I can't believe this is actually the, the law, and it is. And I dug a little deeper, and and it's really regarded as one of the most unfair aspects of the law, which is sort of a hard a hard thing to do. But that is actually that that's this is actually what can happen. So this is why we say, hey, look, before you become a U.S. person. You really want to get tax advice because, oh, by the way, here's a simple fix to it. I'll give you the, I'll give you the, the, the incredibly valuable tax advice. If you are going to become a U.S. person, the move is to sell all your property the day before you become a U.S. person, then buy it back immediately. And now your basis is the, the value of what you bought right. it for. That's how you, that's how you avoid this. So anyway, I want to turn it over now to John Richardson, our great guest, John Richardson, about the five types of Americans abroad. And you know, where are you on this list? If you are an American abroad, I want to know where you where you find yourself here. So uh, why don't we start off with this one? Accidental Americans. Tell us tell us about them. Yeah, so, so before we before we go through these groups, yeah, um, it's it, part of the problem is I, I think we need clarity on uh, you know what the question is we're talking about. If the question is, uh, you know, is it wise to become a U.S. citizen? That's slightly different from what we're about to embark on now. What we're about to right is talk about the way that the tax code impacts five types of Americans differently, five types of Americans. Yep. Right. So I think this is useful. I think this is important. Okay. But it's not, you know, we're, we're veering slightly off, you know, the question of, you know, somebody living in Monaco and do they want to become a U.S. citizen? But that's fine. You know, just, just to be clear on that. So the problem, the context of this is always, you know, the impact of the U.S. tax code on people who don't live in the United States or in the case of people who want to become citizens and live in the United States on things they've had prior to, you know, becoming an American. What we're talking about now are the five types of U.S. persons, U.S. citizens 
uh, who live outside the United States, okay? And I think this largely explains, Keith, I saw the comments uh, in the two posts that you put up this week, and, you know, there's very little agreement on whether this is a problem and if it is a problem to the extent that it's a problem. And I think that a lot of this just depends on whether people have been impacted by this, but these are five groups. Yeah. And if I may add, John, just to interrupt for a second, I think it's also a problem, as we discussed the other day, on whether the individual is actually in the U.S. tax system. Well, absolutely. If you're not in the U.S. tax system, you don't have a problem, okay, until it becomes a problem, you know, right. you're not in the U.S. tax system. But absolutely. And I think that to a large extent, you know, when comments are made by people who are not in the U.S. tax system, I'm not sure their comments are of any real value, you know, to the discussion, right? But, it, but that said, so here, here are five groups. And as we go through these, um, what I'd like you to focus on is how they experience it, how the problems of one group are different from another group, et cetera. And this, by the way, is why, let me tell you where I'm going with this. One would think that with something as unjust as U.S. citizenship taxation, it would be very easy to get a, you know, everybody, you know, to oppose this. But it's not. And the reason is that it doesn't affect people in the same way. And what you'll see is that some of these groups, I, I wouldn't say they necessarily support the current system, but they're very much opposed to changing the current system for reasons that I'll get to. So let's start off with, you know, the, the accidental Americans, who are, I think, the loudest group out there. You know, these are people um, who basically have lived their whole lives pretty much outside the United States. Uh, they have no connection to the United States in terms of a financial center of gravity. They're completely taxed residents of the country where they live. Some of them, don't they don't identify as American citizens usually. They certainly don't file U.S. taxes. They're just people who, you know, sort of, uh, you know, they were born to a parent in the United States who was there briefly on a green card or a study permit or something of this nature. Many of them have no memory of ever having lived in the United States. However, I would add that I think this does include uh, the children of families who moved abroad, okay, while these children were, say, under the age of majority or something like that, right? Never, you know, enter, you know never had any reason to be yeah. in the Taxes. So this broad group. Now, now, here's what characterizes this group. First of all, they don't have U.S. source income. Okay, period. Uh, we know from the FATCA thing that uh, because of the identification of the place of birth in the U.S., they may have bank account as, a, access issues. Now, I'm not minimizing that at all. That is a serious problem. Try being cut out of having bank accounts. But these are not tax problems, okay? I mean, their assets are not, you know, sort of about to be com confiscated. They don't care about U.S. tax policy. This is interesting, okay? You know, their beef with this is, why am I subject to this at all? I have nothing to do with America. They don't care how the tax rules work so much. They care only that somehow they're kind of subject to them. Uh, they just don't want to be subject to it, which is, I think, you know, fair enough. Absolutely. Also, interestingly, notice that they're likely dual citizens from birth. So if they were to enter the U.S. tax system, they probably could escape the exit tax. You know, so, I mean, for some of these people, U.S. citizenship really is a free second citizenship because they're dual citizens. Yeah, well, that's a good question. Right. There you go. Right. So. For oh. them, their perspective would be, well, I guess as, as long as you're not frozen out of a bank account, what's the problem? I have the well, that's option. That's exactly right? right. That's exactly right. They have huge benefits. Uh, the way the U.S. treats them is far less harsh than, you know, ones who are not dual citizens from birth. So quite honestly, I mean, I get I get their, you know, their their perspective totally. But I would just add that. You know, they are the beneficiaries of this dual citizenship from birth exemption, which really gives them a free U.S. second citizenship with, you know, with very few of the problems. And, you know, they apparently they can get out easy. Right. They, they can get out without that's the. Right. right yeah. Huh? That's, that's that's nice. Yeah. So I don't know why, you know, more of them don't see it that way. I mean, there are people who will pay lots of money and spend lots of time trying to get second citizenship. Well, and and to finish this, Keith, hold on. 
Sure, sure. In a real sense, okay, the accidental, they don't see it this way, but I do. In a very real sense, the accidentals, because of the dual citizenship from birth thing, are preferred American citizens. There, there's something I don't understand, and maybe you can help me on just on this particular aspect. So you're an accidental American, and you're moving along, and you don't have any problems with your bank, so you're fine. But something happened or whatever, and you've decided that you want to renounce. So you have the exit tax waiver because of being a dual citizen. But if you are renouncing with U.S. tax compliance, that doesn't mean that you're not going to be paying something to the IRS because you may be having PFIX or other things where you could lose a lot of money. You see what I mean? Am I missing something there? Well, yeah, well, yes and no. I mean, theoretically, you're correct. Okay, but to use your phrase, the reality on the ground is yeah, that if they were to use, um, well, A, you know, they could use the relief procedures for former citizens, you know, and, and right. you know, matter at all but the reality on the ground is that uh, most of them are not going to have uh, you know huge amounts of tax owing okay etc and and honestly okay all right um, i think that this is well a much exaggerated problem for accidental americans they you, they they have benefits that other people don't and why they don't i, I don't know why they don't understand this okay well what, what 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 exactly would happen in, in a cover you know because okay let's let's run through what happens here if let's say that you are you you are an accidental american and you want to renounce your US citizenship and you say well i don't really want to pay any money and so instead of having the your five years of tax compliance that you're required to certify for a form 8854 you just don't Right, you I don't. know many who just and just, and renounce and that's it. You know, he, and here's the consequence. You know, the consequence. You know, the 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 threat to to you know people who don't have the dual uh, citizenship exemption to their exit tax is like, oh man, you might really get hammered uh, with a covered expat expatriate audit, even though they seem to be pretty rare. But in this case, well, why would the IRS do that? Because no matter what they do to you. They're only, you know, they, they can either get you on your income taxes for the last three years, um, but they can't hit you with an other exit tax. And so, you know, I think we are talking about a theoretical thing that if you are an accidental American and you've never been in the U.S. tax system, that if you just renounce and never do anything after that, what's, well, you know, really what's going to happen? I mean, the great benefit, another benefit that accidental Americans have is that they're not in the tax system. Right. Um you know, it's, it, I, I've said many times in my life, and I didn't quite understand this at the beginning, but now this is just, you know, the gospel, is that for most Americans abroad, entering the U.S. tax system is the first step in renunciation. You know, they... they oh, right, yeah, right, yeah, yeah. That's often the case. Yeah, no, and that's often what we do. Uh, you know, we do a streamlined disclosure. We go either one year back, you know, two years back or one year, period, year back, one year forward in order to get it done. Um, so, so yeah, so ultimately though, so, so an accidental American really, you know, again, now, now we, you know, there's some, some and look and there's, we're not to minimize the fights and, and the problems because they, they're definitely there. Our, our good friend Fab Fabian is, has been fighting this in France. Um, he's an accidental American. He's, he's been fighting this for a while. Um, but again, we're saying if you are not impacted by the, the, the banking constraints that we're saying, if that is not there, you're really not all that worried about it. Um, and it actually can be an incredible benefit. And not only can it be an incredible benefit, you have a benefit that no one else does because you have that dual citizenship from birth status, um, which is incredibly powerful. Well, that's right. And this is, uh, you know, if you compare, say, the situation in Europe to the situation in Canada, which has nothing to do with the tax uh, laws, but it has to do with, you know, what are the forms of identification, open bank accounts, stuff like that. I mean, there, there are very clearly, I have no idea what the numbers are. But there are very clearly many, many uh, people who are technically American citizens in Canada who, you know, just uh, have never disclosed their U.S. citizenship at all. Yeah. Now, here's just a quick right. comment from Melvin asking, aren't you automatically a covered expat subject to the exit tax yes, if you do yes, certify? You yes, you are. Yes, you are. But but then the part two of the thing is, what does it mean to be a covered expatriate? Okay. Yeah. That's, well, that means yeah. different things to different people. I mean, being a covered expatriate is not fatal. But, you know, here we go already. Uh, yeah. You have to be born or born in the U.S. No, no, you, you have to be you have to be entitled to both citizens at birth. But hold on a minute. Here we yeah. go. 
or as Ronald Reagan used to say, there he goes again. Um, it's, you know, I, I mean, we could do a, a podcast on any one of these questions. Let's try to keep this general. Okay, okay, okay. Um, so, so sorry. Have, we'll try. Okay. Boy covered expatriates <laughs> you have to be tax compliant. Yes. Yes. The point I'm making here, the point I'm making here is this that the dual citizenship exemption from the exit tax is huge and it allows accidentals to remain American citizens far longer than say the daughter of the American revolution or something like that. Yeah. So, I mean, it depends how you look at the accidental American situation. I know how they see it and, and I understand that. And I think that's reasonable, but they're not seeing, uh, you know, the benefits that they have because they're accidental Americans either. Right. But yeah, I know. Right. That is that is something that I mean, that as long again, as, as long as my bank account, I didn't have bank account issues, that would be my preferred status that you have this little card no one knows about, really. Exactly you do. Right. Um, but no, one, you know, so and, and I think, you know, there was a comment up from Casey earlier. Right. And I think this is this is sort of the haunting thing about like, well, should you do it? There's plenty of reasons. You never know the future. And boy, is that true. I mean, that's really to remain or retain. Well, right. well yes. <laughs> the answer is yes. Right. We don't know. So we're trying yeah. to you know, we're trying to war game the future and that we do know that it could matter. I mean, that's ultimately the, the uh, that's ultimately the truth. It could matter. It could be something incredibly helpful for you to yes. get a U.S. citizenship. Incredibly. Um and so I, I think we have to recognize that it, it, we and we don't know that, you know, we don't know um, exactly how the world is going to turn out. That's for sure. Well, right, so to, why don't we? Yeah, go yeah, ahead. Before we go to the next slide. Look. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here, all citizenships have value. And yes, U.S. citizenship has value. The problem with U.S. citizenship is that it's very costly and time consuming to be a U.S. citizen. Right. So the question yeah. is. Does the value offset, you know, sort of the cost? Now, U.S. citizenship, there are two citizenships in the world, as far as I can see today, that uh, are extremely toxic, okay, and where you really have to, I think, decide, you know, are the benefits worth the cost? The first is obviously U.S., okay, you know, because of the extraterritorial regulatory regime that includes taxation. The second is Russian, okay. You know, and you can see this because of the sanctions on Russian citizens generally, right? Mm -hmm. So it's quite interesting that of all the citizenships in the world, you know, the two that come with problems are U.S. and Russia. Oh, my God. That's wow. Wow. I guess the Cold and War was won by who? I'm not sure. That, right. But, you that's know, I mean, I was looking at um, yeah. a website just last week. Um, and I can't even remember exactly what it was. I mean, they were very clear, you know, that they would not serve as Russian nationals, you know, because of the sanctions, et cetera, right? Um, so, I mean, it's, it's, wild. Very, it's very interesting. That is wild, right? The uh, Yeah, that, that, that's something else. And, and it really, and I think, you know, the, the Americans, you know, the accidental Americans really do have something there because, again, here's a key. The exit tax doesn't apply. And that's just a, you know, get out of jail free card that no one else has. And you there's... Know, a, Accidentals are preferred citizens. They just had, yeah. They just can't see it this way because they're so focused on one aspect of this. But anyway, yeah, that's all. Right, all right, we're gonna get on here. We're gonna move on to the next one. Oh, okay, works. this is this is a this is a good one. Uh, you know, retiree abroad. This is this is a big one. Uh, folks who earn their money and folks who earn their money in the U.S. and um, left the U.S. in order to. Uh, for retirement, uh, they now here's some facts. You, this is this is this is typical that we something that we run into. They retire abroad. That means they were working in the U.S. That means they're they don't they're, all their income is U.S. foreign source. Maybe a local bank account with a little bit of interest. Um, and they want to and what they want is just a continuation of this current system. It's what they plan for. Um, it's what they're living on. Um, if uh, they're a tax resident abroad, then all U.S. income foreign source to their country source of residence, um, and they may or may not be a tax resident of a of, of a country of residence, um, and they're not likely to have a second citizenship, so they're not really thinking about renouncing. 
And this is the fact for them. They're not damaged at all by the U.S. extraterritorial tax regime because it's all income is, is U.S. source. So it doesn't matter to them. They're only damaged as much as every other regular American is, right? Uh, nothing special about them. So, uh, John, what do you have to say about these folks? Yeah. Well, I, I think that they, in terms of the, the movement to bring people together to get a change, I think they're a very serious impediment to it. Uh, I could imagine the AARP even writing an article saying, you know, hey. all, all attempts to change the U.S. Taxes, uh, tax system. Now, now, why would that be the case? Well, you know, their concern is that somehow a move to residency-based taxation would mean that they would no longer be taxed as citizens but as non-resident aliens, and therefore a lot of their passive income would be subject to a 30% withholding tax, subject to a treaty reduction. Uh, Etc. So they're very nervous about about any kind of change, and and they also come with a powerful enough lobbying group that I could imagine that if a residence-based taxation bill were in front of Congress, I bet you that they would have paid lobbies begging for there to be no change in the U.S. tax system. Don't wow. forget also that yeah. not aliens don't get the standard deduction. Okay, you know, which is for you know, which shelters fourteen thousand of income, which is not nothing, you know, to a lot of retirees. Um, so they are they are not an ally, uh, generally. And they're organized. I mean, that's the thing when you say when you say AARP. Oh boy, that's that's a real lobby there. That's a pretty pretty powerful lobby. And there's exactly. nothing I can't think of anything we have that's nearly. Nearly close to that. Uh, yeah, so that well, I don't think we have anything anyway. Okay, uh, other than just a few people, and we'll get to that in a minute. But right. I, Keith, I Keith, do you do you agree with John on this? That you think, Keith, do you think that um, uh, retirees are abroad or just uh, could be uh, hurting us, hurting the cause? Well, they can, they can. I mean, because you know their financial center of gravity is in the United States. That's a problem. And yeah. and and what is. Um, unfortunate well i don't know if i say fortunate or unfortunate but what is interesting about this is that american pensioners american retirees have a wonderful um, lobbying group called aarp that would back them up whereas yeah. american immigrants who are so fractured don't have an entity that's going to be as powerful as aarp well, you have so 9,000 subscribers. How I have 9,000. You have 9,000. So so yeah. we got a little bit to go. The, 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 yeah, AARP is in, uh, you know, they lowered, I, you know, they're advertising to me now. I'm in their target demographic. They're, they're very insulted by Right. That, so they, the they, they you know, they, they're, they're pretty powerful. So they have that backing there that could put a real um, spanner in the works, yeah. you know, a wrench in the works. But, you know, I, it's a question of, you know, is the, what's the majority of Americans overseas? Are they American pensioners or are they Americans uh, overseas, American emigrants? I think it you depends know? on the country. Um, yeah. Yeah. You got certain does. countries, uh, Mexico, for example, where there's just, you know, an a lot. lot there. Right. France has a lot of American. Not gonna, I don't think too many Americans retire, though, to move to the UK or somewhere. You know, but no, yes. they do move to France and they move to Portugal. Well, no. France, France, there's significant tax benefits, right? That exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the point is this. I wouldn't go so far as to say they support the current system. I don't even think they know what it is. But to be clear, yeah, man, that's the point. any change to the current system, right, that would affect yeah. the way their income streams are taxed. And that's the problem. All right. All right. Let's move on to our next type of American abroad, the Digital nomads. This this is uh, we like these folks. We have a bunch of these as as clients, and there's a lot. There's a lot of groups out there. There's a great channel. Uh, the the what is it? The Digital Nomad Channel. Nomad Capitalist. There's a great channel out there. Uh, he's got a great audience. Um, and so yeah, these guys have a totally different way of looking at it. John, explain to me what we mean by digital nomads and why yeah, they keep in mind it. Really fascinating, and you know, I've done a few podcasts. Uh, with, with one of them, the My Lad and Life guy recently, and in the conversation with him, I understood this a lot better. So basically, you know, first of all, digital nomads, they're primarily sort of younger people who want to go out and see the world. 
and you know they and they they leave the United States and they you know they go somewhere and they you know they work generally off their often off their laptops you know or, or what have you but but here's something that needs to be understood uh, before now now the retirees abroad notice their income stream for investment income from U.S. sources right and possibly yep. social security these people. Their income is foreign source. And let me tell you why that is. Because under the Internal Revenue Code, income is source of the place where the work is actually done. So let's take Mexico as an example. You could have an American, 25-year-old American, you know, feeling a bit adventurous, whatever, and uh, moves to Mexico or goes down to Mexico. Uh, it may be not a permanent resident, but just, you know, it's pretty easy to kind of be there. Uh, works in Mexico, has no income, and they're, they're able to do this, by the way, as long as they have no income sourced in Mexico, or, or, or sorry, as long, as long as, as, how can I put this, as long as their income, okay, is paid from outside of Mexico or something, you know, they can do this. But anyway, from a U.S. point of view, this is foreign source income under the Internal Revenue Code. Now, what's fascinating about this is that, now notice they're not, they're not, probably not taxed in Mexico on this. But it's foreign source income vis-a-vis -vis the U.S. Now the foreign earned income exclusion comes in, right? Where they can, uh, it's up to 126,000 U.S. dollars this year, where they're able to exclude up to 126,000 U.S. dollars under the income tax rules. So look at what's happening here. So they get 120. Now let's say this 126,000 dollars is paid in the from U.S. sources. They're running some kind of a business not taxable in Mexico, excluded from taxation in the U.S., all of a sudden they're paying no tax, you know, up to 126000 Isn't that amazing? So they're exploiting yeah. the foreign earned income exclusion. Now, to be clear, there, there is the self-employment tax issue, and that's a reason why a lot of them will incorporate, you know, foreign cor corporations. For any people in that category who might be listening to this, I think long and hard about that. I think you might be better off just paying the self-employment tax and seeing that as an investment in U.S. Social Security down the road. Um, honestly, okay, I know that 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 will come as a shock. It would have yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm 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 sitting down. So, but now now that I think about these things, I think, boy, you know, maybe I should have done some things like that. But but here's mm. the thing: even if they pay the self-employment tax, right? It's 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 a tax of like fifteen percent or something. I think somewhere yes. in that range. I mean, it's yes. not huge, it's not huge, and mm -hmm. I think it could be seen, you know, sort of as an investment in their future. Now, the other thing about digital nomads, well, if if you could generalize, I know you can't generalize, but my impression of them is, first of all, they're under no pressure to renounce U.S. citizenship. Right, none. none. The system works for them; they yep. love it. Yep. You know, and, and as one one guy put it, I think very very well on the Twitter thing, he said, "Look." As an American, yes, I'm a U.S. tax resident. No problem. I don't have to sever tax residency with my country. I love my country. I want to be a tax resident, especially because as a tax resident, I can exclude 126000 of income, mm. right? of, of, of U.S. source income. So these people are not allies. Believe me, they are not allies. Yeah, well, this is and 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 as we're going along here, and this is sort of in in each one of these three people, we're so so far they're like they're not impacted, but all the all that's going through my head is like tiny changes in your life, tiny changes in your life that could whoa 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 change everything, and well maybe we'll be getting that to the next side because because there are sort of people where because so far everybody we 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 all the, the three types went over and i think this is really explaining the problem why it's hard to get any force going because we have three types so far that really are are fine with it as fine as well, any other are, american yeah, would they, be yeah they vary the digital nomads to use your phrase they lean into the us tax system they love it for them it's mostly a benefit for the accidental for the accidental yeah. american uh, you know, it's a problem, but they're not in the system, right? So, you know, their issue is the banking thing. 
Yeah. I mean, retirees are broader. They're, I mean, they're just clueless. Okay. They're just, you know, living their life. They don't need, no. And it's like, they're, they're, you know, in the way they're kind of retiree tourists. They're not really, you know, they're living there, but they're not really a part of that country because they don't need to participate in the economy all that much other than to get the things to consume in their house. They don't, you know, like, well, my money's coming somewhere else. So they don't need to engage in, you know, a business or, you know, working at all. So that's, they're just sort of there. Oh yeah, we're there. We're, jo we're enjoying the low cost of living. Yeah, yeah that's what it really comes out. For them is that even if they are, again, it's very hard to generalize. I mean, somebody can always come up with some country somewhere where this doesn't work. But but my general point is this. Clearly for the retiree abroad, their income streams are U.S. source. So if they are taxable in their country of residence, the country of residence, always if there's a tax treaty with the U.S. at least, okay, is yeah. going to be offering a credit for U.S. taxes paid, okay? So their life is, it's not much different, you know, yeah. uh, well, they have, they have F bars and they have form 8938, but I mean, you know, that's not a big deal. Uh, I mean, you get yeah. used to those, right. That's not a big deal. That's not going to, that's not going to keep you up at night crying, banging your but head. They, by the way, even use non-US bank accounts. Okay. Yeah, right. <laughs> this is interesting because, you know, in conversation with digital nomads. Yeah. You know, one of the points they make to me is they just keep all their money in the U.S. anyway. Right. Right. And so, therefore, they avoid the F bar, the Form 8938, et cetera. Right. So but it's really something. People, yeah. Young people, they don't have families. They're not yeah. even settling down. I mean, that's a stage of life where you can do this. You're not. Right. Gonna, if you do it forever, I think you probably haven't had much of a life. But anyway. Okay. So, all right, uh, so let's get here. So, uh, all right, uh, let's move. Uh, ready to move on to our next type, the expat temporarily abroad. Um, yeah. Let me this is yep. what I mean by who this kind of person is. Okay, what I'm envisioning here: these are the kinds of people who, you know, they're sort of they have a career in the United States, and all of a sudden somebody says to them, "Here's an opportunity to move overseas for a few years, you know, to build our brand here." you know, et cetera, et cetera, right? So they move and they bring their families and, and their income, their income from employment is almost very likely to be foreign source, okay? Because, they, uh, you know, because that's, that's where they're working. Of course, it's foreign source, right? So uh, they're going to be tax residents of the other country where they live, right? But what's happening is that, yes, they file uh, foreign and U.S. tax returns. But now here's the interesting thing. Because it's a temporary thing, their financial center of retirement planning investment is not in that country. It remains in the United States. Okay, That's right. That's the key. That right there is the key. That's yeah. the key. So they deal with, uh, you know, they, yes, they deal with the problem, okay, of filing a non-U.S. tax return. But for them, the way this, you know, works is that say you make a five hundred thousand dollars or something, which they probably are if they're that kind of person, right? Uh, you know, that gets taxed. Say in Canada, you know, it gets taxed first in Canada. It's gotta be taxed at a higher rate in Canada. They use the foreign tax credit rules, you know, et cetera. So they're not paying, you know, any US tax. They keep their financial center of gravity. I mean, I see this a lot for UK people, you know, in the United States. And yes, it's an irritation, okay, for sure, and they don't like it, but they don't have the problem that the final group, the immigrants do, because their financial center of gravity remains in the United States, okay? Um, you know, yeah. they, I mean, they're, uh, let's see, uh, what do we put here? Yeah, the, the, I mean, I you know it fairly well you know who that kind of person is yeah it's you know you know um the first the first the first person i encountered so like that uh, was working for microsoft in switzerland and oh you know the only problem he had is that his he he married someone who had some some assets and didn't report them and so he had you know all of his income reported normally everything 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 that was the normal working overseas thing was all taken care of and filed but everything else that was ancillary that that sort of he picked up on the way he didn't report and so oh, okay that's that's how you can you know that's where you could create the problem because you're when when you start creating financial attachments in the place where you are living this is where it goes a little this is where it gets a little crazy well that's right now that's yeah right. um now pension plan for example right so let's say 
I don't know, just say, you know, company X or whatever, you know, so you go and you go to say Switzerland or wherever, and you work for company X and company X has a pension plan and this sort of thing. And, you know, you're acquiring this non-U.S. pension plan, you know, as part of what you're doing. I mean, these are things that, you know, may very well create uh, U.S. tax issues. But uh, again, uh, they tend to be sort of one-off uh, sorts of things. Where this becomes a problem to move to the final group, number five, is where the temporary... Well, that's, yeah, and that's where I want to... I, I just want to introduce, uh, get to this because we've won over four so far. We've won over four types of Americans abroad so far. Four out of five. And we, so far... The four out of the four we've discussed really don't have a big of a problem. So, so Keith, what's the deal with your group there? Um, we, we these yeah. people don't have problems, do they? We, there's no problems overseas. Are we exaggerating what's going on? Because four of these five groups really don't have a big problem. Um, but there is somebody with a kind of problem overseas, isn't there? Well, well yeah. yeah. Also, sorry. Before, sorry. Just one sec. Yeah. I should have added to that that immigrant thing. Okay, or the, the expat, I'm sorry, I should have added that these people often are not citizens, right, uh, of the uh, of the country of residence. Notice digital yes. nomads, uh, yes. expats, retirees abroad might be citizens of the country where they're living, probably are not. Yeah. The accidental Americans yeah. almost always are, which gives them protection. The next group, though, is the perfect storm. Yeah, so, well, this it's, is, and this, and so go ahead, Keith. Yeah. And, you know, I, I was going to say make a statement and then I realized that my statement is not going to be totally correct. My right, statement is well, I'll start out with what I my statement is, is that a pocket of the population of Americans overseas who do have problems are American immigrants with an E where their financial center of gravity is in outside the United States yeah. in their country of residence and who are in the U.S. tax system. However, I'm going to add on to that because I'm dealing with someone which is in a little different situation, is that those who also have problems, and I'll do my best to say this, are Americans overseas who not necessarily are in the U.S. tax system, but are married to a non-American. And if that non-American has significant assets, and that non-American wants to gift or, or give or put in the name the, uh, either the American spouse or the American children, that can create a problem moving forward. So there are that big pocket wow. of Americans yeah. overseas who have difficulty with the current U.S. tax system. There you go. Keith, thank you so much for that. That's absolutely right. Um, that that one of the biggest, this is a, a tremendous issue. We did spend some time on this on, on a previous podcast, how how it's it's very alarming. Imagine you're you're married, you're you're um you have to tell your you have to tell your spouse um the horrors that you're a US person and that some of the your assets that you own jointly uh, have to get reported and there may be taxes due. And it's an ugly, ugly situation that put, can put a tremendous right. amount of strain on America. Or, uh, on your, Ameri children. or, your, or your children. Or your children, right. And, um, you know, actually on, on this Thursday, on January 11th, um, for those of you interested, uh, I'm going to be doing a podcast with Francis Kelleher, who's Ireland's number one relationship coach. And we're going to go and talk about how to tell your spouse the bad news that you have a tax problem. Um, and oftentimes it's, you know, where, where uh, people just sort of have big tax that they have been hiding from, from their wife. But sometimes it can be um, a wife having to tell a husband about the, the, the reality, the nature of her U.S. poisonous citizenship right. well, and how it could affect their financial um, products overseas. Yeah. Well, um, well, think about, you know, and I'm just going to add on this and then we can move forward. But think about the husband who is not American and has a significant amount yes. of assets. Okay. Yes. A significant amount. And everything is in his name. Yes. The American spouse has nothing in her name and the American child has nothing in his name. And he needs to start thinking about future. What yes. does he put in their names? Because if yes. he, when he dies, what does he gift? That's a major, major problem. Unless the American spouse and the American child renounces. 
Keith, that is beautifully stated. You're absolutely right. I mean, that's a huge, huge, significant problem. So, so I would say five types of American abroad, emigrant and emigrant, you know, and, and then really if you're the emigrant and, and, and actually, I guess if you, you know what, if you're a U.S. person, that doesn't necessarily just mean if you're overseas because the same thing could apply that if you're, you know, if you do move to the U.S. and your U.S. your non-U.S. spouse becomes U.S. spouse and now you have sort of the same thing and you didn't get the planning done. Yeah, it can really this is this is a very sensitive topic. I mean, this is really horrible. So, uh, yeah, this is this is the group that um, the the immigrants, the people who who are committed to actually living overseas and for long term and want to make a community, live there, work there, have their life there. That is who's hurt the most. And I think we could really see the nature of the issue that we have is we only have one of these groups. Is saying, hey, there's a problem. Hey, look, you other four, it could happen to you at one point. Something changes. But the problem that we have in getting any, and, and one of those groups, right, and then the retiree group, not that they would be opposed to us, but their lobby isn't, you yeah. know, their lobby will be working against us. So we have, you know, four groups right. saying either uh, we don't uh, 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 we don't care or we're kind of working to keep yeah. it there. And only and one group is like, guys, this is yeah. nuts. Uh, and here's the other thing. It, yeah, here's the other thing, and I think Melvin just stated it in the comments, is that American retirees who are living in their country of residence and their financial center of gravity and their pension is in that country of residence can also be a problem. So you have that population of American retirees that where it's problematic. You see what I mean? Yeah. yeah. But they're American emigrant retirees. Right. Right, and that's right. It's a different, you're right, a, 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 a different distinct, a distinction when you're where. Where's your financial center of gravity? That's really the question that we need to get to. Um, John, anything to add about uh, immigrants? Anything, anything else we should add about them? Well, notice that they're usually not dual citizens from birth either, right? That's right. So you know they are under tremendous pressure. I think to to renounce, and actually, I think they should. Uh, you know, the, I mean, this is once you see, once you sort of slice yeah. and dice who these people are, uh, it becomes a lot easier to understand why it's hard to have a conversation in Keith's group, you know, where where there's an awful lot of agreement because people's perspectives on this are, are completely a function of their circumstances, wow. by the way, whether they actually file U.S. taxes, right? I mean, we know. Uh, just based on the accidental American thing alone, there are plenty of U.S. citizens who do not file U.S. taxes, right? And you know, right. I mean, no disrespect intended, but I don't, I don't think that it's reasonable to pay any attention to the opinions of people who don't file U.S. taxes. I mean, obviously, they're not impacted by it if you don't file, right? Right, yeah, certainly yeah, right. in the yeah. immediate. Yeah, yeah, and I think that, you know what, and this is, and and this is, I think we got, you know, we're getting to the end of our time here. You know, this is this is what I'm going to say is our our sort of call to actions. You know, because we 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 could see how splintered each group is, right? But do you understand? Okay, digital, okay, um, uh, Americans, you know, accidental Americans. Okay, what happens if your bank account? is actually frozen what happens if it is impossible and then people are you know, well you got to do something about it maybe you need to unite with the whole group what if you are you know what if you're a retiree uh, you know what if you're a retiree with your u.s center of gravity still in the u.s well what happens if you meet somebody overseas what happens if a whole new life happens oh boy now this easy tax system that you've been fond of and fine with oh now becomes a problem um, what if, you know, what, what if something changes in your life significantly that puts you in the camp where your financial center of gravity, and, and again, you're not, you, it, it, your financial center of gra gravity is outside the U S and you now have to be in compliance. There's something right. that's required. So if those two things happen. You have to be in compliance and something changes in your life where your financial center of gravity is no longer in the U S you are now <laughs> you are now going to be one of the people who is facing the brunt of the horrors of the U.S. taxation system. Right. So I think really the thing exactly. here, and I think, you know, John, I got to say, I got to say, John, I really want to thank you for how you describe the five different groups, because in my experience, totally, totally lines up with my experience. And that helps me sort of distinguish who am I talking to when I speak with somebody and how can we inform someone? How can we best inform someone who's spouting off to say, oh, what are you proud of? The U.S. tax system is great. Um, how could we help them to understand it? And I think we, and actually, I think we actually got, actually got to the point. It's when your financial center of gravity 
moves overseas, you're still a U.S. person. You have to be in compliance. Life will not be all that fun. And that's really the thing that can make it. And I would say, there you go. So, I mean, we're kind of answering the question, is it, you know, U.S. citizenship worth it? Well, again, and if I, if I may yeah, go ahead, add, yeah, please, please. If I may add, because of the majority of the people with whom I work, it's very important to explore all of your options, all of your options today and also how it's going to look moving forward. You can't just have a myopic view of this. You really have to get as much knowledge as possible and really discern which options are going to be the best for you, regardless of what group you may fall in. in. You know what I mean? Whether you're an accidental American or an American immigrant, et cetera. You got to take a look at all the options that are available to you. That is beautifully said, Keith. That, that, that's absolutely right. Um, and that, you know, and again, and it's like just because someone is saying the, the, the tax code is a problem, understand their circumstances. Understand that their circumstances may be completely different to you. So they're giving you advice that really is not the right advice for you. Speaking of which, as we get to this, I want to uh, give a shout out to Keith, he's uh, Keith for this, for his group. Um, really appreciate the audience that he's built. If you are thinking of renouncing or getting into compliance and you're not sure, and we've done an episode on this, that you may not want to immediately just talk to a U.S. tax expert like your, myself. There's certain things I have to say. Um, I always have to advise compliance. If you're sort of trying to figure out, and this is the real value Keith adds because he understands this, your situations vary. And so just a blanket statement to say, comply, 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 comply. Well, again, I'm not going to say <laughs> that's what I have to say. If you're interested about what other people in your particular situation are doing, reach out to Keith Redmond, Global Advocate for the American Abroad. Here is his email. US underscore overseas underscore advocate at outlook.com. Reach out to Keith and he can give you an idea, a real, a non fear mongering, a realistic boots on the ground representation of what's going on with people and how they're handling uh, issues that they're having. Likewise, if you uh, really believe that uh, all loads, roads are reading, leading to renunciation, um, uh, I suggest you reach out to my great friend, John Richardson. He is, uh, here's his email, citizenship solutions at uh, protonmail.com. And by the way, check out his article below. It's in the description. Um, and that's where we got this uh, slideshow. It was a wonderful, wonderful, um, I, I really appreciate his keen analytical mind that I think properly segmented uh, these types of group and why we really can't get the agreement and really can't get a lobby going to make anything, you know, all that important happen. So if you're seeing the, the if you're seeing the reality and, uh, 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 you're thinking about ex ex expatriating, uh, reach out to John at citizenship solutions at protonmail.com. Yeah, go ahead, John. Two things, Anthony, uh, before we wind up today. One, I just want to throw this in. At the beginning, we were talking about whether somebody, you know, should naturalize a U.S. citizen. And here's a point that I think is extremely important that I've never seen discussed anywhere, and it's this. That if you remain a green card holder and do not become a citizen and move out of the United States, depending on how long you've been there, you can use a tax treaty tie break to become a non-resident of the United States. Okay. And that can be unbelievable. Yeah. That. People from the transition tax, all kinds of stuff. So becoming, yeah. by becoming a U.S. citizen, you're making yourself subject to the treaty saving clause, right? which generally speaking denies you benefits of tax treaty. So bottom line, if you want to have the benefit of a U.S. tax treaty, stay as a green card holder. Do not become a citizen. Okay? Very important advice. Wow. Now, on another note, um, so we talked about this prior to the show. On January 21st, I'm going to be in Prague uh, having a general uh, – discussion on all of these sorts of issues. And as I understand it, uh, now that's at one o'clock Prague time on Sunday, January the 21st. But as I understand it, Anthony, um, we are going to make that an IRS medic episode so that people can 
worldwide log into that if they like. Is that That's what? right. Yeah, we're going to do that. I do have to take off for choir, for choir but uh, I think we'll have time for that because we're going to be going to what, 9 Eastern? What time is that going to be? No, seven, it would be 7 Eastern. Oh, I'll make it. No, I'll make choir. I'll make choir. No problem at all. Time. Yeah. Well, you can do uh, some singing wanna... too. I mean, there you know, we go. That's okay, but I think that you know that might be helpful for people who are interested in this kind of discussion. I think I said seven p.m. I meant seven a.m. Eastern. All right. Well, well so I'll have no problem making that. Yeah, it was thirteen hundred hours uh, in Prague. Um, right. Yeah, I mean, I think that would be uh, a great sort of IRS medic uh, podcast, you know, for the week. I think that'd be wonderful. Yeah, we'll do that. We have some great, yeah, we have some great episodes coming up. So uh, again, uh, please, uh, we thank you for watching. You want to subscribe and you want to turn on those notifications so you know when we're going live. We usually do this 7.30 every Tuesday, but sometimes for special events like this, you never quite know when we might be uh, uh, going live with some incredibly important information that you, we really appreciate your questions and comments, really do. With that, this is Anthony Perry. Oh, by the way, if you're looking to reach out to me, you can send an email to aparent at irsmedic.com. Here's my email here. If you're thinking about being a guest, you have some something very important to tell me, uh, want to reach out to me, just see how I'm doing. Aparent at irsmedic.com. This is Anthony Parent for Keith Redmond and John Richardson. Thanks for watching.